Father, we thank you, God, today that we can be in your house with other believers who are like-minded, of like-minded faith. Lord, we can worship you today. God, I pray that as we praise, as we worship you, God, that all the worries and the concerns, God, the things that may be on our minds this morning would, would uh, fall by the wayside. And Lord, that just for the next few minutes, we could focus our attention, our eyes upon you. And Lord, I just pray that, uh, Lord, you'd inhabit the praises of your people. God, that you'd make your word come alive this morning. Teach us, draw us closer to you through the service this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you, Jesus, that you're bigger than anything that we're facing this morning. You're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And Lord, we put our faith in you, Jesus. We put our hope in you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Have your way in our hearts this morning. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah.
God, that's our heart's desire to allow you to have your way. Lord, we want what you want, Jesus. Lord, you said if we delight ourselves in the Lord, that you would give us the desires of our hearts. Lord, we want to have eternal desires. God, not temporary, fleeting cares and pleasures of this life. But God, we want our eyes fixed on what is eternal. Lord, help us with that this morning. Hallelujah. We just give you praise. We give you honor. We yield our hearts, we yield our minds to you, Jesus. We want you to have your way, not just another worship service, 
but God, a face-to-face -face encounter with you, like Moses at the burning bush. Lord, we want to hear your voice. We want to hear you speaking to us. Lord, you know exactly what's going on in our hearts this morning. God, you're able to minister. God, you're able to help. You're able to heal. God, we just give you glory. We give you praise with every breath. Lord, we want to worship you. Lord, we just give you praise. We give you honor. You're worthy of our highest praise this morning. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Light of the world, you stand
you, Jesus, that you illuminate our footsteps. We thank you that you are king, Lord. You are sovereign. Our circumstances, though they may be dark at times, Lord, our city has experienced darkness over the last couple of months with the violence and things. Lord, you have spoken into the darkness. You have shined your light. And God, you are king. You are on your throne. You're not pacing back and forth across heaven trying to figure out how to fix our problems. You're the sovereign king of kings. Lord, you're altogether lovely. You're altogether worthy. You're able, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that faith would arise in the hearts of your people this morning. God, that no matter what problem we're facing, no matter what difficulty, what adversity the enemy may try and put in our pathway, God, you're still God. Hallelujah. And we're going to praise you, Jesus. We're going to worship you. We're not going to let our eyes get fixed on the darkness, God. We're going to keep our eyes upon you, Jesus, the light of the world. We just give you praise. We give you honor. Hallelujah. Let's sing that verse 2 again. Maybe you're facing something this morning you have a need. As we sing this, let's remember he's the king. Amen. He's still on his throne. At his right hand, there's power. Amen. There are pleasures forevermore. Whatever you have need of today, as we sing the second verse in this chorus again, just lay it at the Lord's feet. Amen. Don't pick it back up. Leave it there. Amen. And God wants to do a work in hearts this morning. King of all things, oh so high. to that some today. Um, Dad, can you actually bring me one? I didn't leave one for myself. And I think there's some more on the back table if, uh, if we need extras. Um, but I want to share a message this morning entitled, Failing to Yield. Failing to Yield. And if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Thank you. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. We'll look at that in just a moment. Most of us 
We talked about failing to yield. Uh, you can go to that first slide, Monica, if you've got that there. We think of a road sign, don't we? When we talk about yield. And uh, many drivers think that this means, this yield sign that we once a long time ago read in our test that we had to take, the written test. Remember your written driving test? You wonder if some people ever took it, right? <laughs> but we learned way back then what a yield sign means and the different signs. Many drivers today, I think, think this means speed up really fast before someone gets in your way. Have you found that to be true? That's not what it's supposed to mean. It's supposed to mean you yield to the other person uh, if you have the yield sign. But I think a lot of drivers think it means, oh, this is my opportunity, I better speed up before someone cuts me off. The whole concept behind a traffic circle. How about you? I would like to just slap the person whoever designed a traffic circle. I think about the only thing more aggravating is clover leaf exits off of a freeway. Those can get annoying as well, but a traffic circle. The whole concept behind a traffic circle, the reason why it annoys me is because it operates, doesn't it, on the assumption that people know how to do what? Yield. And they don't know how to yield. Our society does not yield very well. And all you have to do is go down to center, New Center Point, into the traffic circle, go to Juarez, Mexico, or one of these cities where they have five lane traffic circles. And you'll see that not very many people anywhere in the world know how to yield. And, uh, but that's what the sign means, is we're supposed to give the right of way to the person who has the right of way. And that was a concept, but I think that was a wrong assumption by whoever designed traffic circles. In fact, some of the most horrific car accidents I think that we've seen probably in our lifetime have to do with the result of unyielding drivers, right? You got someone looking down at their cell phone texting you got the other person, you know, fixing their kid's car seat, you know, turned all the way around, or the dog is running back and forth from the front seat to the back seat, and you get those two people running into each other, and neither one of them yields, we can have some pretty bad car accidents. You know, that's just a reality of life. And I think there's some spiritual applications that the Lord wants to show us about failing to yield in our spiritual lives as well. And uh, I want us to look at some things. Webster defines yielding as this, to yield means to give or render as fitting, rightfully owed or required. To give up possession, we don't do that very well, do we? To give up possession of a, of a claim or demand. And so we need to learn what this word yield means because our yielding, proper yielding, has a lot to do with what we receive from the Lord. And I want us to see some things. I think the Lord wants to show us some things. I want us to consider this statement pretty much as the premise of this message. Failing to yield is the main reason that many believers are not filled with the Holy Spirit. And I just heard that while I was at camp meeting. It was kind of really in passing. And the Lord dropped that upon my heart as a message that He wanted me to share. The main reason most people are not filled with the Holy Spirit is because they're failing to yield the way God wants them to. And I think there's some things that all of us can learn and apply uh, in our lives. If you have your hand out there, seven steps to receiving the Holy Spirit. Um, that's uh, brother, uh, brother Donnie put that out a few years back. And I want us to look at the seven steps. If you go on to the second page, um, it starts at the bottom there. Seven steps to receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit. This is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many of us believe this morning that it's God's desire that every believer be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Amen? We believe that. We believe that as a church. And so there's seven steps. You're, you're not fully equipped if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's not condemnation in that. You can still go to heaven without speaking in tongues, without being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We don't believe, as some UPC churches do or other apostolic so-called churches, that you have to speak in tongues to make it to heaven. But why wouldn't you want every tool, every weapon for the warfare that God has called us to? Why wouldn't you want all the equipping that God's made available to us to live a victorious Christian life? So seven steps Donnie mentions here in this uh, packet. I want you to keep this and, and uh, remember this. Number one, you have to be born again. That's the only really prerequisite to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is you have to be born again. I think most of us have experienced that. Salvation comes when we by grace, through faith, say yes to Jesus. Amen? We stop saying no to Jesus. 
We stop saying yes to our own way and we say yes to God's way, God's redemption plan, which was Jesus and Him crucified. Amen? We get saved. It's by grace through faith. And then number two, uh, you must decide that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is scriptural. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, and many other passages. But at least those three show us that believers on three different occasions have had uh, been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit and received it with the first evidence being that they spoke in other tongues. There are eight other evidences. If you just speak in tongues and you never demonstrate a greater passion and power in prayer, if you never demonstrate a greater hunger for God's word, if you don't become a more bold witness, but you speak in tongues, you still might want to question whether you really receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first evidence will be that God takes over the, the member that gets us in the most trouble on our body. He takes over our tongue. Amen? James chapter 3 says our tongue is a fire, and it can cause a lot of damage by the things that we say. So God takes control of that first, but there ought to be eight other evidences. Amen? After we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's scriptural that God wants to fill us. You must have faith. Again, properly placed faith. By grace through faith, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God, I believe it's for me. I want it. I want your Holy Spirit to flow in my life. I want the moving and the operation of your Holy Spirit in my personal life. God, I want it in my family. God, I need it in my church. My community is desperate, isn't it? Colorado Springs is desperate for the moving of the Holy Spirit. We don't need gun control. We don't need another policy. We don't need another so-called leader that doesn't understand the ways of God. We need the Holy Spirit to move in revival across our city. So we must have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, it says in that. We need to know that. We must not fear. A lot of people are afraid of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and in their minds, the devil has a way, or they've heard somebody tell them that it's just like demon possession. You're not in control of your faculties or your mind or what you're doing. Your body just goes into some kind of crazy thing, and that's such a lie of the enemy. And they can say, oh, what's of the devil? Some Baptist uh, brothers and sisters say it's of the devil. And you know what? If it's of the devil, as Pastor Mike Moserell said while he was here, it's the only thing that the devil promotes that lifts up Jesus and allows us to draw closer to Jesus. So think about that. It's not of the devil. It's of God. And he wants to give us the Holy Spirit so we can become a little bit more like Jesus. And we can have the power to witness, the power to do greater things than Jesus did because the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And so we don't have to fear. All we have to do is ask. Amen? And you're in full control. You have to yield your tongue to the Lord. It's not like demon possession where people are out of control and demons throw you up against the wall and make you do things that you don't want to do. You have to yield, like we're talking about this morning, to the Holy Spirit and say, flow through me. You begin to speak as Donnie has said many times. You start it and God finishes it. You begin to speak the words that he puts into your heart, into your spirit, and then the Holy Spirit takes over from there. What to expect? You expect the Holy Spirit to put supernatural words, which we call tongues, the Bible calls tongues, into your spirit. And then for the Holy Spirit to move upon your vocal organs. The Lord will not force you to speak in tongues. He will give you the utterance, the Bible says, but you have to speak it. And it may not make any sense. It's not supposed to make any sense to you. And it's not just gibberish. It's a known language somewhere in the world that God is using to speak the wonderful works of God through you. And so we need to understand that. Number six, one of the major points I want us to focus on, we must yield. Do you see that? We must yield. By yielding, he says, I'm meaning that in your heart you should say to the Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to fill me with the Holy Spirit, and by faith I now receive. We don't have to beg for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's a free gift, just like salvation. It happens by way of the cross. It happens by grace through faith. Neither are we to continually pray out loud in our own tongue because you can't speak two languages at once. You can't speak English and speak in an unknown tongue that God's trying to baptize you with uh, at the same time. And number seven, the last one, all you have to do is receive. You don't have to earn it. It's not because your parents were Christians. It's not because of a particular denomination or fellowship that you're in. It's because you just simply ask the Lord and you receive. God, I want what you have for me. I receive. I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to look at three things this morning. Number six on that paper we're going to really focus on, the idea of yielding. And again, the reason why most people 
are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've gone forward before and you didn't get filled and you got discouraged. The enemy put all kinds of things in your head, lies, because he doesn't want you to have all that God has for you. It's all about yielding and keep on asking, keep on seeking, and the Lord's going to fill you. Three things that God wants us to know about failing to yield this morning. Number one, yielding to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. How I many you know that's the most important first step in our relationship with God? It's yielding to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Most of us could probably quote these verses, especially if you're Pentecostal, amen? If you're Pentecostal and you don't know Acts 2, 1 through 4, there's something wrong with you, amen? Number uh, Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Amen? So we can see right there in that passage what we just looked at. A lot of the steps, those seven steps, we can see born out in Scripture. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, why was the Holy Spirit poured out on this group of disciples? Was it because of their unity? That's what a lot of the modern church says it says they were all in one accord in one place and because of their unity god said wow look at their unity look how together they are i'm going to pour my spirit out does that bear out with the rest of scripture no we're, we're looking at the first point to not, to today yielding to jesus christ and him crucified isn't that why the holy spirit was poured out on this group of, of believers because they had fresh in their mind what jesus had just done on Calvary. They may not have understood it all like we do because they didn't have the Word of God like we do today. But they had fresh in their minds. They eyewitnessed it, many of them, right? What Jesus did at Calvary. The things He told them before He went to the cross. And it was fresh on their minds. It's not because of some so called unity. That's what the modern church teaches. The Holy Spirit will be poured out when we finally have true unity, right? So all the churches in town need to get together and have true unity. And most of it's not scriptural at all. They use Psalm 133, verse 1. Maybe you've heard it. I've heard it in pastor's meetings in many different cities that we've pastored in. Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And they use that scripture nine times out of ten out of context. And what they want you to do is drop your doctrine, drop, drop your beliefs so that you can come together, quote unquote, have unity with other so-called believers all over our city. Again, we're not in Colorado Springs to be a thorn in everyone's flesh, to purposely cause contention and strife. But I think we need to realize the truth of God's Word about His Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost not because of some man-made unity. It's because of Jesus Christ and Him crucified that the Holy Spirit was poured out. Rick Warren and others are telling the church that the Pope is the leader of the entire body of Christ and that we should be uniting together under this Pope. The modern church's idea of unity is not biblical. It's really nothing more than compromise and watering down what we believe in order to come together. And it's not why the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Think of most of the churches that are talking about this compromise, this watering down of our beliefs so that we can come together with other believers. They're not seeing the power of God in their services at all. They're not seeing people baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're not seeing a book of Acts experience in their everyday ministry. So why would we want to water down and compromise what we believe to come together with people who do not have the power of the Holy Spirit? We need to say, no, Jesus, it's about you and what you did at the cross. And when our eyes are on that, when our faith is fixed on that, you're going to pour out your spirit. And then these who are trying to manufacture something that's man-made, they're going to want what we have when they see the spirit of God begin to move. Amen? When they see souls getting saved, when they see people getting delivered and set free from addictions, we need to realize the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost because of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And the people yielding to that. The reason those disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues was because they had fully yielded, entirely placed their faith in Jesus Christ 
and him crucified. God's redemption plan from the foundation of the world. Think about it. These 120, at least 120, had dropped everything and were fulfilling what Jesus told them to do. In Luke 24, he says, wait for the promise of of the Father. What was Jesus talking about? He was talking about what they received in Acts 2, 1 through 4, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These people dropped everything in their life and were seeking after God's Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit that Jesus said he would send. And so that should show us the priority that the power of the Holy Spirit needs to have in our life. Amen? That the church needs to put on the power, the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. And you don't see that much. You see very few churches talking about the baptism. Most of them don't even believe. If they're not preaching it, they don't believe it. And we need to have the power of the Holy Spirit, just like these 120 that were in the upper room. We need to make it a priority and be fully yielded. God, I want all that you have for me. God, I need the power of your Holy Spirit. Concerning the man-made unity infiltrating most of the modern church today, their use of Psalm 133, verse 1. Listen to this quote from Brother Slager. Unity in such fashion can only be brought about by compromising of Scripture, which affects the very foundations of the faith. Amos asked, can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3.3. 3. There is no way that one who believes in salvation by grace can walk together with one who believes and teaches salvation by works. That's most of the conflict that's going on, isn't it, in the, main, in the modern church? The Holy Spirit is now in the beginning steps of separating the body of Christ from the apostate. It may not be totally discernible to all, but it will be discernible to those who know their Lord. The Antichrist spirit is increasing almost daily in the apostate church. However, the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit is about to begin strongly in the true body of Christ. The apostate church will have its unity, which has Satan as its foundation. The true body of Christ will have its unity, which is the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and Him crucified. As people begin to unite their faith under what should be the object of our faith, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, I believe, Brother Swaggart's been preaching it, we've been hearing it from those who know the message of the cross, that there's coming one more outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. And it's going to make the Azusa Street outpouring dim in comparison, I believe. Amen? There's going to be a harvest of souls. There's going to be miracles and signs and wonders again. We need to be having the proper focus of our faith. When we yield to God's redemption plan, to the it is finished work of Jesus on Calvary, we won't necessarily be well liked. Have you found that to be true? Why is that? Because it deals with people's pride. They have to lay down their religion, don't they? They have to lay down it's all about me and selfishness and self-righteousness. You won't necessarily be well liked or accepted, but it's what will allow the one more last day's Holy Spirit outpouring. Amen? Amen? When we're looking to the cross. Mark chapter 10, verse 22. Mark 24, verse 9. Mark 13, verse 13. And Luke 21, 17. Four passages that all pretty much say the same thing regarding those who place their faith exclusively in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It says this. Think about how this is compared to what the modern church is teaching. Jesus said this in all four of those passages, almost word for word, four different writers. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. When you really know Jesus, you really understand the gospel, the cross, God's redemption plan, Calvary, the finished work, however you want to refer to it. It says you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Amen. We'll receive the end of our salvation. We're already saved, but God's going to finish what he started in us. Amen. We're going to be hated. It doesn't say that Colorado Springs is all of a sudden going to come together and the Baptists and the Assemblies of God and the Presbyterians and the non-denominationals are all going to have this wonderful unity. Brethren are going to dwell together in unity and then God's going to pour out his Holy Spirit and there's going to be such a powerful move of his spirit that everybody just loves the Lord and comes running to Jesus. That's not what the Bible says, is it? That's not what happened in the first century church. They were persecuted and even killed by Nero and other rulers during the Roman Empire. How can we not expect the same thing today? There's going to be a, a, a coming against the true gospel, but we need to endure to the end because it's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the only thing that's going to bring the power of the Spirit that can bring the change that Colorado Springs needs. Amen? 
It can bring the change that our lost loved ones and lost friends need. And we need to realize we're not going to be popular. We're not going to be accepted. We don't need to be looking for that kumbaya moment, amen, with other churches. We need to pray that the truth is the banner over Colorado Springs, amen? That God's Spirit moves in truth because the message of the cross is being preached. That's what our focus needs to be. We can have the moving, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days before Jesus returns, just like Joel prophesied. You remember that prophecy? It's repeated in Acts chapter 2, a few verses later, that from what we just read. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 29, it says this, Joel prophesied a thousand years before Jesus, or several hundred years at least, before Jesus came on the scene. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. We will have this fulfillment. We've seen a beginning of it on the day of Pentecost. The former and the latter rain. We're going to see more of the latter rain before Jesus comes back. Do you believe that? He's going to pour out his spirit. And this prophecy is going to be fulfilled in totality. We've seen a little bit of it. When at the turn of the century here in our own country. When we saw Azusa Street. When we saw the two young girls in Topeka, Kansas at a prayer meeting. who said, God, if your Holy Spirit is real and it's for today, then baptize us. And we saw a move at the turn of the century, which really led to the development of the Pentecostal denominations in our country. And we've gotten away from that power of the Holy Spirit because we've gotten away from the cross. But God's going to fulfill this promise. He's going to pour out one more time, but we need to be yielded to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Number two this morning, Holy Spirit baptism is not earned. It is by grace through faith. Holy Spirit baptism is not earned. It's by grace through faith. It's not when we say, I'm no longer going to dance, cuss, drink, or chew, or hang out with people who do. You guys remember that? That's, that, was, that was some people's uh, whole idea of Christianity. That's not what saves us from our sin, right? I'm not going to drink, chew, uh, dr dr dance, cuss, drink, or chew, or hang out with people who do. We think that's what saves us. We, we've got some things to learn. It's when we exhibit genuine faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified that we get saved. Amen. And God cleans us up. It's not us trying to clean ourselves. It's God cleaning us up from the inside out. Recognizing that when Jesus died on that cruel cross, I died with Him. Amen. That's when we get saved. When He rose from the dead three days later, I rose with Him in newness of life. Romans chapter 6. That's really what salvation is all about. God doesn't wait for us to clean up our act. Praise God for that. Amen. He doesn't wait for us to clean up our act before he saves us. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. That's grace. Amen. Grace that doesn't take the cross out of the picture, but that makes the cross the central focus. That's grace. Salvation is by grace through faith. Sanctification. That process of growing and becoming a little bit more like Jesus every day. It's also by grace through faith. We go back to the cross, right? And we lay down our lives daily. Say, God, I want to grow. I want to become a little bit more like you. Holy Spirit baptism as well is by grace through faith. So we ought to seek the Lord for it. God, I can't earn it. I'm not going to beg you for it because, God, you've promised it to me. We ought to seek Jesus, the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, to baptize us by faith. We sang it this morning in the song. Baptize me, Lord. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. Baptize me. And again, it's not just a one-time deal, amen? The Lord will refill us. He'll give us a fresh infilling of His Holy Spirit every day if we'll just seek Him for it. If we'll ask Jesus, the baptizer, to fill us. John the Baptist told us that Jesus alone is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. It's not Donnie Swagger. It's not whatever preacher maybe that you heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the first time under. It's Jesus that's the baptizer. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist said this, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. He's talking about Jesus. Amen. He who comes after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus is the baptizer. So when we are seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we ought to be seeking Jesus. Amen. We ought to be praying to him and saying, Jesus, fill me. Give me what you've promised, the promise of the Father. Let it be fulfilled in my life. It's time for believers to once again submit to 
to once again yield to, to once again earnestly desire and posture themselves in the Holy Spirit's manifest presence. God, we need you. We need you in Finished Work Worship Center. We need you in Colorado Springs because our lives are a mess without you, Holy Spirit. We need the comforter, amen? We need the spirit of truth. We need the Holy Spirit to come and empower us to be better witnesses. We don't have to beg. We just have to yield, amen? We just have to yield. And God wants to teach us how to yield, amen? I've served the Lord since I was five. I got saved when I was five, but I'm still learning at 43, 38 years later, how to yield to the Lord in worship and how I live my life, aren't you? It's a process of God teaching us, us being clay in the potter's hand. Sometimes we think we got it figured out and that's just the time that God crumples us up and puts us back on the wheel, amen? And sometimes it's painful. It says, no, there's some other things I want to teach you about yielding. God wants to teach us how to yield. Luke 11, 11 through 13, it says this. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to those who do what? Who ask Him. He wants to give us the goodness of the power of His Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit baptism is for every believer. We don't have to beg Him. It's not something that we earn because our life is so righteous and holy before Him. We'll never get there if that's the requirement. Only in Jesus can we be righteous. But it's when we, by grace through faith, say, God, I want all that you have for me. Fill me to overflowing. Number three, quickly this morning, then we're going to spend some time in prayer and close. Number three, failing to yield is why most do not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You might say, what happens, Pastor Eric, if I come forward, maybe people lay hands on me and I don't receive? Well, like Pastor Mike said a couple weeks back, you'll be no different than you were before you came up. You're still saved. Amen. God is still on his throne. His word is still true. You just didn't receive. You just need to keep asking. Amen. You need to keep seeking. There's not some great failure on your part if you don't receive. It's what the devil is trying to do is put what ifs in your mind before you even take a step of faith. Isn't it? That's usually what happens. Or Pastor Eric, I've responded to an altar call before for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I didn't get it. And I'm discouraged. I don't understand why I didn't get it. I was there. Back in 1986, I was 14 years old, actually I was 13 years old the night before, and uh, the Prebles were there doing revival. They were singing and ministering the Word of God. They called people forward on May 18th, 1986. Said, those who want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Central Bible Church, Nashua, New Hampshire. And God was moving in that service. His presence was real. And I think in those services we had seen a, a, a boy that came in and and he had, and I'd heard this a lot from my grandparents and from the ten revivals. But there was a boy who came in whose leg, one leg was shorter than the other, and he was having trouble even just walking. And I remember he came forward in one of the earlier services in that revival, and God healed him. His leg actually grew, and he was actually uh, instantly healed in front of everybody in the, in the altars. And then after that, they prayed for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. May 18th, I went forward. People laid hands on me, they shook me, they spit on me, they yelled and screamed and said, some will say, let it go, some will take, receive it, say, receive it, some will, you know, you get all those crazy things when you get in the altar. People are sincere and they just want what's best for you, but sometimes they're, uh, you know, saying, you just need to listen to what God says, amen. Jesus is the baptizer. I didn't receive, and we spent a long time, we lingered in the altars for probably a couple hours before we went home that night. The next day, we had service May 19th, which just happens to be my 14th birthday. Isn't God good? He wants to give us good things. Amen? Went forward again, and this time I was just off, I remember, in the stairs, over to the right, almost in the corner, where nobody else was, just me and the Lord. And I said, God, I'm asking you again. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nobody laid hands on me. Nobody touched me. Nobody was even over there praying near me. And God baptized me in the Holy Spirit. was speaking in other tongues. And so we need to recognize that it's when we yield to the Lord and we just keep on asking. Matthew 7, verse 7, ask. In the original language, it says, keep on asking. Amen? Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, 
receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. As Brother Swaggart had said, if you don't quit, God's not going to quit on you. He's going to give you everything that you need, including the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you didn't receive before, maybe there's some yielding things that God's trying to teach you. He's not wanting you to clean things up. That's not what I mean by yielding. But maybe you're not focused properly on Jesus as the baptizer. Maybe there's a distraction in your mind. When you were in the altar, maybe you were distracted about somebody else or thinking too much about the words that you have to speak instead of looking to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? God wants to teach us some things about yielding. And if we'll just keep yielding to Him, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, He wants to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. God is not going to withhold the Holy Spirit from anyone who exhibits proper faith and is fully yielded to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Psalm 84, verse 11. Look at this verse. Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Underline this part. No good thing. Do you see that? No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. I believe the Holy Spirit baptism is a good thing. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. James chapter 1, verse 7. He wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And we just need to believe and realize He's not going to withhold any good thing from us. He's going to fill us when we seek Him for all that He has for us, when we're yielded to Him properly. So if you came forward and you did not receive, God's telling you again today, come and ask the Lord again, yielding yourself. Like Romans chapter 6, verse 13, we'll close with this scripture this morning. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead because of what Jesus did. Amen. We're alive. Yield yourselves as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. God, the reason why I want the baptism of your, of your Holy Spirit is not so I can impress Pastor Eric. Not so I can impress the SBN ministers when they come. But I want it because I want my members to be an instrument of righteousness. God, that you can flow through. I recognize that Jesus is desperately needed in this community. And I want you, Holy Spirit, to flow through me to make a difference in the lives of others. And with that motive, God is not going to withhold any good thing from you. He's going to fill you. Amen. He's going to baptize us again and again with the power of His Holy Spirit. I want us this morning to stand. We're going to close in prayer in time of responding to God's Word this morning. Don't leave this place this morning having failed to yield to Jesus Christ for your salvation. If there's some sin in your life, something that you know is not pleasing to God, make that right with Him. Time is too short to be playing games. Amen. Too, too short to be playing church. And if there's something that's not right in your life that's a sin, we need to confess that. We need to say what God is saying about it. Amen? And make things right with the Lord. And it's as simple as saying a prayer. Jesus, I believe that what you did on the cross is for me. Save me from my sins. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. And I believe, Lord, you'll save me. And you pray a simple prayer like that with your focus of your faith, being Jesus Christ and Him crucified. By grace, through faith, God says you're washed. Amen? You're sanctified. You're set free. You're saved. You're ready for heaven. And if you need to do that this morning as we close this time of worship and prayer, make things right with the Lord. Yield your heart to Jesus for salvation because you can't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit until you're saved first. That's the only requirement. But most of us, I think, here this morning have received the Lord in salvation. We've yielded our hearts to Him to save our souls. Today you have the opportunity to receive God's promised Holy Spirit. And I want to give us that opportunity. Jesus, the baptizer, he's present this morning. Can you sense his presence here this morning? He's here. And he wants to baptize believers. He wants to refill us. He's searching for those who will just yield to him. Who will simply ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're listening to this message somewhere else. Later on, right where you're at, you can ask the Lord to baptize you. Jesus is a baptizer and he's able to meet you right where you're at. You will speak in a language that you've never learned or that you've never studied. But again, like I said, as a known language somewhere in the world, and the Holy Spirit begins to prompt you with that language, with those tongues. God doesn't make you speak, but you will sense words that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to speak. And as you yield your tongue, as you begin to speak those words that the Holy Spirit's prompting you with, 
those utterances, the Holy Spirit is going to flow through you. And if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you want a refilling this morning, then I want you just to say this prayer together with me when we come up. I want us to just say this morning, Jesus, can we just say this together? Jesus, I believe. Amen. Say it after me. Jesus, I believe that you are the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And by faith this morning, I'm asking you to baptize me. I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. In Jesus' name, I receive. Amen. Amen. If you want to receive for the first time, you want to be refilled, I want you to come forward. I want to pray with you. Those of you who have already been baptized, if you want to lay hands on those who are coming, is there anyone that's the very first time you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you want to be filled this morning? Would you come first? And then I want to have the rest of us come. And let's pray. Let's seek the Lord for a few minutes before we dismiss. Let's let Him refill us. Amen. And as you come forward, don't speak in English. You may start out in English, but if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, would you just allow that Holy Spirit to flow through you as he puts those words in your mouth? What are you saying, Pastor Eric, when you say those tongues? You're speaking the wonderful works of God, prompted by the Holy Spirit. You can't go wrong, amen? You're not going to cause God any grief or worry if you speak what the Holy Spirit's putting in your heart. But we're going to put this song on, I will pour water. And I want us just to come forward, if we can, every one of us, and let's lift our hands. And let's let the Holy Spirit fill us one more time. We need it as a church, amen? We need the power of the Holy Spirit. This city needs Jesus. It needs the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through our lives to point them to Jesus. So let's take a few moments this morning and let's let the Lord fill us. Let's let him refill us with the Holy Spirit today. Hallelujah.
touch Jerry, God, this morning. Fill him to overflowing. Let him be a vessel, God, a conduit. God, that your Holy Spirit can flow into and flow through, God, to others. We want Jesus to be lifted up, God, in our families, in our community, God, in this church. Speak to our hearts, God. Show us your ways, your will, God, your plan, Jesus, as we're in your presence this morning. Hallelujah. We come before you, God, humility, brokenness, and trembling at your heart. Lord, we want your will to be accomplished. Oh, and set my spirit free. Thank you. 
for refilling us, Lord, with the power of your Holy Spirit. Let us be dependent upon that every day, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you thanks, Lord. Bless us, Lord, as we leave this place this morning. Let us take what we've heard this morning with us. Lord, let us share it with others, God. Let the power of the Holy Spirit guide and direct our steps, our footsteps this week. We thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor and glory for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. In Jesus' name.